Mr. Paul. Here we go, going live. To make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lusk. Must be Wednesday. Hey, Nick, I got your email. I said not had a chance to, uh, to respond to it yet, but I will when I get to it. Won't be long. Probably do that tomorrow. Hey, I'm glad y'all are joining me tonight. Good to see Chad Roberts checking in. Looks like we got about 10 folks already on. Y'all beat me to the punch. That's super. I'm glad y'all are here. Um, talk tonight, I've had a couple of questions about fertilizing ponds, so I thought I'd hit that topic. Hello, John Funk, Tim Stewart. We got John Funk from Michigan, Tim Stewart hanging out in Florida, and the bluegill are eating up there in mid-Michigan. That's sweet. Hey, Drew Bachman from North Carolina. Dick Tabbert, where you been, man? Glad to see you, buddy. Glad you're back. Hello, Frank James. Good to see you, buddy. I still owe you a phone call. <laughs> yeah, my life's been a little hectic lately uh, between remodeling the house, playing with grandkids, not letting them die. My, uh, as a grandparent, your job, I, I used to think my job as a grandparent was to teach the little darlings and feed them well and, you know, get their naps on time. Eh, no, none of that. Nope, no. Nope. My job is to keep them alive until their parents show back up. That's what we do. <laughs> Hello, Billy Miller. Good to see you, buddy. Glad y'all are checking in. Hey, you know the drill. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. John Funk's already on it. And um, click like. Share this or click the little heart icon. Share to your timeline. And you're going to be eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat. And guess what? Drum roll. Anybody got the drums out? Hello, Mike Fornash. Good to see you, buddy. Mike Cook. I see Mike Cook. Howard Detrick, Howard's going to ask a question. matter of fact, Howard chose the topic for tonight. But look what's in, folks. Beyond the Basics, the book is here. I'm pretty dadgum excited about it. There it is. Here's the back cover, front cover. For those of y'all that can't read, there's a lot of pictures. Look at there. Check that out. Pretty cool. We have some room at the end because when you print something, you got to do it in increments of 8 or 16. And so uh, we had some extra pages, so I stuck some bunch of pictures in at the back of some of the cool people I've been able to work with and some of the fun things that I've been able to do, you know. So pretty cool. $29.95, which includes shipping, which is substantial, by the way. There's Michael Eric, Danny Mack, Fisher Feeding. I bet they are feeding insane, especially with this latest front. But anyway, for the drawing, I'm going to give away a book and a hat. So the book's... $29.95, it's on the Pond Boss store. We've already sold a few of them, pre-sold a few of them, tickled about that. Mike McPherson, good evening from Indiana. I see you, Mike. I see John Henry. Yeah, John, it's been a while, buddy. Glad you're here. Let's see here. Let me see what else we got going on. Tom Davis from Ohio. Howard Dittrich's over in uh, Florida via Iowa and San Diego, but I think Florida's probably the hot spot for him to be hanging out. Let's see who else we got here. I don't think I've missed anybody if I, that I know of. I, there's got to be more because there's 37. You know, um, I do, I do, before I get into this, Tom Davis ordered the book. Well, thank you very much. This Chris Aguilar, his Wednesday night date with his lovely bride, he the Boudin man. There's Wyatt checking in from Denver. Matt Marsden, Tennessee. American Fish Tree. Drew Schmidt, good to see you. Um, I do want to do a quick shout out. To Michael Reese from Kentucky. Hey, Michael, I hear you're a big fan of the show, and I'm really, really glad that you watch. I appreciate it. You're, uh, you're and your bride cleaned out a pond, and you guys are enjoying that, and I know that you uh, hustle in on Wednesdays and come to the Pond Boss Church, so I'm glad you're here. Thanks for coming and hanging out with us. This is a fun group of guys. Tommy Wells wants to know how to get rid of leeches. You know what? I'll hit that. Yep, Billy Miller, the flash flooding. Yep, I got some calls today. On that, you know what? I'll circle back and answer those. I'm going to go back up here to to the top. I am going to talk about fertilizing ponds. I see Dave Davidson. You're up kind of late, old timer. <laughs> Love us some Dave Davidson. He's an IT headhunter from Fort Worth, Texas. One of the key, actually, he was the very first moderator of the Palm Boss website back in I think 2005 on Ask the Boss <clears throat> on the forum. If you guys haven't checked out pondboss.com ask the boss discussion forum that's a big deal it's in its uh it started in 2002 so it's in its 20th year 
Sweet. Okay, so let's see what we got going here. I saw some questions. I saw one. Mike McPherson, uh, is Diquat and 2,4-D specific for aquatic users? Is it all the same? Can't wait to hear your, something your book. Okay, so um, there are types of Diquat, like Reward, and there are types of 2,4-D that are branded and labeled for use in ponds. So don't go to the feed store and just buy a herbicide because uh, buy those that are labeled for use to target the species of plant that you want to eradicate. You know, and do some due diligence. Spend some time on Aqua Plant website at Texas A&M. Uh, there's one at the University of Florida as well. You need to identify the plant. You need to know what your options are on how to contend with it and how to take it out if you want to take it out. So before you go buy anything, there's different brands with different concentrations with different type surfactants if needed. And that's the kind of stuff you kind of got to wade through, so to speak. That's why calling your pond pro can be helpful. But reading the label, those labels, even though they, they seem to be a little complicated, they're really not once you drill into it. Basically, they're going to try to figure out how many parts per million you need for that plant. And it's labeled for use in water. Don't buy it if it's not labeled for use in water. And the reason I'm telling you that is not because it's any more toxic or any less toxic. It's because it may not have the ingredients to make it work in water. So that's my answer for that. Let's see here. How do you get rid of leeches out of a pond? I'll tell you how I did it. We, uh, <laughs> we at uh, the old LL comma two, which I got to spend last Friday and Saturday there with the new owners. And uh, we seen a couple of the hatchery ponds and moved a bunch of fish, but, uh, I'll never forget swimming in the swimming pond by about year four or five. And it came out and it had five little bitty leeches stuck to my leg. And boy, I knew when the queen hit that water and a leech hit her, she wouldn't like it. You know, she don't panic. She, you know, none, that stuff doesn't bug her. Uh, snakes don't scare her, none of that stuff. But it's just something attached to your leg, sucking your blood out. She didn't quite like, or I knew she wouldn't like. So I went and bought some red ear sunfish. And within about six or eight months, they were gone. I was able, back then, I was able to go find some red ear sunfish that were six or seven inches long and uh, already big enough that they could feed on those leeches, and they did, and it didn't take long. They were gone within about six months. Billy Miller, all the dang flash flooding just made my pond look like chocolate milk. Any cheap, quick ways to help it settle? No. <laughs> no cheap, quick way to make it settle. Now, if its nature is to settle quickly, it will. If it isn't, it'll take longer. But... I would give it mm, two or three weeks and start measuring, measure the visibility. That's the first thing. Start checking to see how far down you can actually see. I get, I, I talk to people all the time and I'll say, well, what's the visibility? Well, it's six inches. Did you check it? Well, no, I looked at it. Check it. You know, I'm going to tell everybody out here, if you're going to be a, a, a in the pond management type of mindset, you need a set you disc. S-E-C-C-H-I, Sechi Disc. Look those up and you can uh, find them. And I would buy a Sechi Disc and measure the visibility. And the way that works is you take the little Sechi Disc, which is a round disc with a cross through it. Two quadrants supposing are black and the other two are left white. Has an O-ring in the middle and a string on it or a, or a stick. And you lower it in the water until it disappears. Then you pull it up just enough to be able to see it. And then you measure the difference distance between the surface of the water and where it disappeared, that's the visibility depth. You know, so if you tell me that the visibility depth is 18 inches and you checked it, then I'm gonna, you know, give you some advice. But if you say, well, it's 18 inches, but I didn't check it, I'm gonna tell you to go check it. So, Billy, what I'm telling you is start checking the visibility and it should start settling out pretty quick after the water flow stops, especially if it's prone to settle out. Um, but if it doesn't, then I would look at gypsum maybe. I think if I remember right, you're in Missouri, right? I think you're in Missouri. Chico turned me on to a fun little summer green. Vodka with squirt on ice. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see here. Robbie Old. You can see Robbie. Kim Moore. One of our loyal faithful watchers, listeners, etc. Chad Roberts, John Dyer, checking in from Cisco, Texas, southeast Iowa, 37 degrees. Wow, Mike, I'm going to be up in that way, in that neck of the woods here in a 
couple of weeks. I'm, I'm a little bit behind, but I'm going to catch up. But I'm going out that way. Jim Norquist. Hello from Georgia Coast. Warmer here than back home. Yeah, I bet it is. Frank James. He's already added 40 pounds and the water is green tinge. Visibility is 30, 33 inches. Would like to add 20 or 25 pounds soon, but afraid to encourage Southern Nyad. Would it help just to add fertilizer in the deep water, avoiding shallow? Sure. Yes, sir. It sure would. Matter of fact, we're going to talk about that here in just a second. Michael Eric's lucky to find a three to four inch radiator. Yeah, well, one advantage I had was an electrofishing boat. Um, Wyatt says, I know visibility with a sechi disc is key, but besides temperature, what should I focus on if I need to reapply fertilizer? I would assume I have pretty low fertility, especially with this dry weather. I think, um, I think, Wyatt, um, I wouldn't expect lower fertility with drier weather because what happens is in where, where Wyatt's place is near Abilene, Texas, and when when you have evaporation, then those nutrients tend to congregate in greater amounts, greater parts per million. So don't automatically assume the fertility is lower just because it's dry. It's not. So let's talk about fertilization for a minute. Uh, and I see Billy just south of St. Louis. Um, and if you're the same Billy Miller, I think you and I and our wives spent a little time on going down the river a few years ago. Is, are you the same Billy Miller? I think you are. If you are, let's see, you used to work for the UPS, if I remember right, and uh, and Debbie stuck a fish hook in her leg, and I pulled it out with a pair of pliers so we didn't have to leave the river. Okay, so uh, Christopher Aguilar, should we add new fish stock every few years to break the DNA cycle of reproduction? Um, that's a complicated question that I'm going to simplify and just tell you no. Because if you have great genetics, those great genetics are going to move forward. Now, here's the problem is when fish species begin to integrate cross. So in other words, like if an Angus crosses with a Hereford, you get a black baldy. When you have a black baldy crossing with a black baldy, then what do you get? You got some calves with red hair, some with black hair, some with white faces, some that are mottled. You know, and with especially with like largemouth bass and, and bluegill to a lesser extent, that, that when those begin to reproduce, you kind of lose that um, hybrid vigor that you have with a first generation cross. So I'll tell you this, and there's an article coming up in this next issue of Palm Boss Magazine that addresses that topic. And here's the gist of the article. It does no harm to add fish to improve your genetics every two or three years or every year and a half or whatever. It does no harm, but it doesn't necessarily make the genetics better than they already are. Now, one thing it does do is it helps bring in some fish that may have a higher proportion of aggressive behavior because you're calling bass out of your pond as you go. And typically when you're calling fish by angling, you're taking the most aggressive fish you've got. So, uh, Okay, Billy, yep, well, I'll have to tell you about the other Billy Miller one of these days. He was uh, west of St. Louis. Okay, so now, um, so let's hit a little bit of talk about fertilizer. First of all, what fertilization does in southern ponds and some Midwest ponds, and to a lot lesser extent, ponds further up in the Midwest and further to the north, and I'll explain that here in a minute. What fertilization does is it adds the nutrients dissolved into the water column that create the microscopic plants and animals, algae and plankton, that in turn feed zooplankton, which in turn feeds little insects, which in turn feeds bigger insects and small fish, which in turn feeds bigger fish. So basically what happens, fertilization where you put the right kind, of, and I'll talk about that in a minute, when you put the right kind of fertilizer in the water, dissolved into the water, it creates the basis of the food chain. Now, one thing to always remember, you've got certain levels in a food chain. It's like a pyramid. We've all seen the, the food pyramid, you know, when we studied science in junior high school. Well, the reality of it in a pond is the food pyramid starts with the nutrients in the water that feeds the plankton, that feeds the tiny bugs and the tiny newly hatched fish, that feed the bigger bugs and the bigger fish and the bigger insects and the bigger fish that feed the bigger fish and the bigger fish and the bigger fish and then you. 
So that's the way the food web works. And at every trophic level of that pyramid, the reason that the pyramid shaped like this is because energy conversion consumes the level beneath it. So to get from this level of plankton to the level of insects, it takes it about 10 pounds of plankton to create 10 pounds of, of zooplankton. It takes about 10 pounds of zooplankton to create a pound. It's 10 to 1. 10 pounds of, 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 of phytoplankton to create zooplankton that creates 10 pounds of zooplankton creates a pound of insects that creates 10 pounds of insects creates a pound of bigger insects and, and little bitty fish. It takes 10 pounds of little bitty fish and insects to create the next 10 pounds or one pound. So that 10 to 1 conversion goes all the way to the top. So when we talk about largemouth bass needing 10 pounds of bait fish to gain one pound, it took 100 pounds of food for those bait fish to gain that 10 pounds. Then it took 1,000 pounds of food for that 100 pounds of insects and small fish to feed those bigger fish to feed the bass. So what fertilization does is it creates that basic level in the, in the food web that allows higher survival rates of your bait fish, uh, creates the plankton that feeds the zooplankton, that feeds the little insects, that feeds your little fish. So what fertilization does is it turns the water a green color, and when that green color gets you know visibility 18, 24 inches, now you're feeding the zooplankton, and there's an article coming up in the next issue of Pond Boss, that I, uh, where I interviewed Bill Cody, wrote the article yesterday. It'll be in the May June issue that shows the difference between ponds that have been. The, 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 and he, it, it talks. It's about managing northern northern ponds. That article, but basically what he's done is he's maintained fertility. And he's got certain species of fish in each of his two little ponds that are consuming, and you can see the change in the water color. It's really really interesting. So in the south. Most ponds are limited by the amount of phosphorus they've got because southern ponds are more productive in terms of biomass than northern ponds are because we have a longer growing season in the south. You know, in the south, like in the middle of Texas, uh, um, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, all the way over to Florida, Georgia, you know, the growing season starts about the second week of March and it kicks in until right after Thanksgiving is when it quits. But if you're, um, if, you're, if you're John Funk and you're up in mid-Michigan, it starts about the 1st of May and it's over by the end of September. You know, so fertility in his ponds up there can't serve the same function that it does down here. Now, if we start talking about fertilizing ponds in Iowa, Illinois, Ohio, uh, northern part of Missouri, um, in, the, in Nebraska, uh, parts of South Dakota, we typically say, you know what, beware, be cautious. Don't necessarily fertilize those ponds because you're in farmland, you know, where the fertilizer is being poured to the crops, percolates through the, the, the field drains, the field tiles, and gets into the watershed, and it winds up in your pond. You know, and so northern ponds have a greater tendency to produce blue-green algaes, which can cause water quality issues throughout the summer. So fertilizing northern ponds is not as common a practice as it is southern ponds. So now Howard <coughs> asked me a question. Let's see here, I see. Okay, I'm gonna, Howard, okay. Drew Bachman's panfish are crazy for Aquamax MVP. Yeah, right now they ought to be feeding like nuts. They sure should. Um, why? If and when the rains do come and the pond rises and clears after a few days, given the visibility of 18 inches, would it be a good idea to fertilize in? It may, it may be a good idea to fertilize in. Keep checking that visibility. And you judge the color of the water. If the water's got a green tint and it's 18 inches of visibility, you're good. Now, also, something real, real important about pond fertility is I'm going to tell you something different in April than what I'm going to tell you in July. Because by, by the time July gets here, Fertility has done its job, okay? Because what fertility's job is really two things, two important things. Number one is to create that food chain for the biomass. Number two is to block sunlight penetration from the bottom to minimize the risk of rooted aquatic plants growing up from the bottom of the pond. So it shades the sunlight off the bottom. That's the two, two things we really want from a fertile pond, and the timing is important. 
The timing is important because we want to make sure we've got the food chain to support those newly hatched fish. That's, that's a big deal. And timing is important because if you fertilize too late and the aquatic plants get the jump start, then you're fertilizing your aquatic plants. So let me see here. Um, there was a question back here I might have missed. Um, okay, Frank James asked about fertilizing in the deep part. Yes, that's what I would do. Actually, I would, right now, I'd go ahead and fertilize in the deeper part of the water because what you're going to do then is you're going to get the fertilizer concentrated out in the open water and it's going to create a bloom a little quicker that's going to dissipate throughout the whole water column and you minimize the risk of fertilizing those aquatic plants that are just now starting to kick in. Okay, let me see here. Howard says, will the bloom increase insects and mosquitoes nearby? Actually, no. No, it won't. Uh, <laughs> mosquito tried to carry off his chihuahua. And that's a registered chihuahua, by the way. So, here's the way I see that. When, when a pond is fertilized, and, and Howard's having trouble getting a bloom on his lakes there in uh, the panhandle of Florida. Now, here's, here's some of the problems. It's easy for somebody like me to say, you know what? Go fertilize it. Get a bloom up to 18 to 24 inches, and it'll be great. It's easy to say that. You know, and, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of the guy's name. Um, Cleon Allman. I was standing on his pond bank back in the early 90s, and I said, now, Cleon, all you got to do is you got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do this. And if you'll do that, then you get this and this and this. He looked me right now and he said, well, Bob, that sounds easy. <laughs> he said, but I think it's going to do hard. And I said, sounds easy, does hard. I love that. So when, when somebody like me stands there and says, you know what, you really need to fertilize and get that plankton bloom going. It's not always easy because every water chemistry is different. Every pond depth is different. Every biological impulse is different. Every kind of plant you've got is going to influence what you're doing. And then the water chemistry is going to influence it. So what's probably happening with, with Howard is when you put a high phosphorus fertilizer into the water and you mix it into the water column and all of a sudden it looks like it's cloudy white, some of that phosphorus is getting bound by the high amount of alkalinity in the water. So when it gets bound by the alkalinity, it doesn't get to get used. So the hard part of trying to fertilize a high alkalinity pond, for example, is it takes more fertilizer. But what inevitably happens is you add some fertilizer, you don't get the bloom you want. You add more fertilizer, you don't get the bloom you want. So you start getting a little frustrated, so you add the same amount of fertilizer, you don't get the bloom you want. At some point, there's a break point when you've added enough fertilizer and that bloom will kick in. And I, I talked to Kenny Dryden, a longtime friend of mine, a couple of days ago, and we were reminiscing. He was the very first pond management uh, client that I had. And I didn't know anything about pond management, neither, neither did he, but we learned together. And they had a ranch down near Laredo, Texas, just a few miles off the Rio Grande, a hunting ranch with about a 30 acre lake on it, crystal clear water. And so he wanted to get a bloom. So we, I helped him find some fertilizer. It was, he, was, he lives in Austin, and he got that lake fertile. But he added a little bit too much, and it looked like pea soup. And oh my gosh, when I went down there and looked at it, I just about died. I thought, oh my gosh, the visibility. And I measured it at six inches. And now by now, and down in Laredo today, I bet it was 90-something degrees down there. And so he had this dense plankton bloom, I knew he was going to have a fish kill. I knew it. And I didn't know anything back then. So I knew. I, knew. I said, man, you're going to have a fish kill. He said, what do I do? I said, well, you either need to do a rain dance or let's figure out, maybe go get some copper sulfate and thin it out or something. Well, about that time, a little storm brewed up in the Gulf of Mexico, ran right up the Rio Grande River and thinned his bloom. And it worked out just fine. So what had happened was he kept fertilizing it and that water was so alkaline that it just it took more than what the recommended dose was to get the bloom that he needed. So at some point in each lake with high alkalinity or even moderate alkalinity, 
you're going to start to see a bloom, but you got to be cautious to add a little bit more, maybe a little bit more than a little bit more, and just keep measuring that. And at some point, you're going to see that bloom begin to take off. Now, Howard, for you, that might mean a 30-inch bloom. And I, I think if you can get a 30-inch plankton bloom, I would be thrilled with that. You know, because that's going to help keep the plants off of the deeper water out there in your ponds. And I think that, I think that would be a, you know, that would be a good number to shoot for. Now, in, in the, in the summertime, what, when I was actively managing ponds myself every day and scraping pond mud out from under my toenails every day, I, this time of year, I wanted an 18 to 24 inch plankton bloom visibility depth. And I wanted it to look pea soup green today. Then I would check it again in a week and it would be a little bit olive colored green. So it would go from a, a kind of a lime green to an olive green, from an olive green to an olive brown, then a brownish olive, and then brown, and the water would go clear. So what was happening there is we had all these algaes in, in this green phytoplankton. When it was pea soup green, then when it was olive green, that was zooplankton beginning to feed on it. And that stuff reproduces exponentially as long as it's got the food and the right temperature. Temperature is the backbone. You guys know that. So then when it turned olive green, then kind of a kind of a greenish brown, that's when the plankton were beginning to consume the phytoplankton. The zooplankton were eating the phytoplankton faster than the phytoplankton could produce. So they were outnumbering it, ganging up on it, and eating it. And then when it turned brown, that's the zooplankton at its peak. And then when the water went clear, the zooplankton ran out of food and died. So what I would inevitably do is when that water started looking that olive brown and kind of a brownish olive, I'd hit it with another little dose of fertilizer. Maybe a couple of, couple of pounds of phosphorus per acre mixed into the water column. you got to mix it in the water column. All fertilizers are heavier than water. If you're going to fertilize, mix it into the water. Liquid fertilizer weighs 13 pounds per gallon. Water weighs 8.3. You know, granular fertilizer weighs more than water. Put it in the water, it's going to sink. Go to the bottom, fertilize your plants. So it's got to be mixed into the water. <coughs> All right, let's see here. Holy cow, y'all are getting ahead of me. Woohoo! Okay, um, oh, I'm going to go back to Howard's question about will the bloom increase insects and mosquitoes? No, it won't. What the bloom does is it creates insects that eat mosquito larvae. It's going to create more um, damselfly nymphs. It's going to create more dragonfly nymphs. Dragonfly nymphs are going to hatch <coughs> and they're going to eat your dragonfly, I mean, eat your mosquitoes. So, a good bloom actually acts to dissuade um, mosquitoes. So, you probably ought to put an anchor chain on your dog. He's laughing right now. I can hear him. Chad Roberts. So here in Ohio, for the first time in my fourth year here, I see this this week I can physically see some sort of a natural bloom. My water, qual water clarity is always several feet deep, so it sticks out like a sore thumb with the wispy green clouds. Okay. <clears throat> now, if those wispy green clouds are microscopic, you're Okay. But if it looks like angel hair moving through the water, that's not a plankton bloom. So if it's got any texture to it, like if you threw a lure out there and you were able to pick some of it up and it's stringy looking, that's not phytoplankton. But it does, it can form clouds and it, it, and it migrates to the surface during the day because it needs sunlight to be able to photosynthesize and, and create energy from carbon. Then it sinks back down at night. Um, at first I was a bit concerned because I've not seen it before, but the fish are more active today feeding on pellets than I've seen all year. I think that's a good thing. Hey, Justin Ludwig. Good to see you, buddy. Okay. Michael Eric, he said he was going to throw a question at me. Maybe this is it. Let's see. The last three springs I've stocked 500, two to three inch red ear in my local six acre pond before the crappie and the bluegills have spawned. No more leeches in the crappie and bass mouths like before, so I know some are making it, but I've yet to catch one and still see lots of snails along the shore. Would have a much better survival rate if I waited to stock them after the gills spawn the first time. Uh, yes, you would, because it's just a numbers game. <clears throat> when the bluegills spawn, you got greater number. You might have 100,000 bluegill that you didn't have three weeks ago, you know, and the odds of the red ear survival is probably gonna go up. If you wait till the bluegill spawn. 
Mike Cook, I've had recommendations to add dye to our pond. With all that being said, wouldn't the dye be counterproductive to the algae ecosystem? Not only is it counterproductive to it, it stops it dead in its tracks. So I, 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 I'm a fan of using dye like in the wintertime and early spring when the water's still cool to minimize the risk of filaments algae growing up early in the spring. But this time of year, I'm opposed to using it simply for that reason. I think Mother Nature needs to have the opportunity <coughs> to grow a plankton bloom and get it rolling so the fish can grow better. Why it says, what would be considered high alkalinity? High alkalinity is anything above 200 parts per million. Danny Max counting on nutrients added in pooped feed. End of last summer, I had a scary pea soup bloom. That's when I went for killing it and clearing the water. These fish can't be satisfied. They want all the feed we can conscientiously throw. Yep, greedy little boogers. <coughs> and the, another thing that uh, Danny Max got is he's got this rock stream that's at a really steep uh, pitch. And he can really move some water. He's got rocks that's a great substrate for paraphyton that can help cleanse that water. Hey, 7 o'clock, Beyond the Basics, look here. It's out, twenty nine ninety five. It's pretty funny, I was talking to Debbie about this a few weeks ago when I sent it to the printer. I was feeling kind of full of myself. Actually, I did this before. I was kind of feeling full of myself and <clears throat> I looked at her and said, hey, honey, what's it like sleeping with an author? She looked at me, she says, you know, it's pretty good. What's it like selling everything you know for 30 bucks? I said, oh, yeah. somehow that made it in this book and Mark McDonald's forward. So I'm a little bit more humbled because I live with my wife. Palm Boss Magazine, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date, and it lasts a year. And I promise you, every one of these magazines right here you're going to get a nugget or two out of it that's well worth that 35 bucks. And one of my goals in life is help is to help you minimize the dumb tax. And I say that affectionately and with deep respect because Debbie and I just paid some dumb tax when we remodeled this house. And the most obvious, and we've done it several times, the most obvious one is the painter. When we hired the painter that came highly recommended to us, uh, we didn't hire the one that was more highly recommended because he was six months behind, which we should have hired him. But the, here's the lesson I learned is just because he has a truck and a ladder and wears white pants doesn't mean he's a painter. So we paid some dumb tax to a guy that painted the hinges, didn't sand for the second coat. So we learned. I learned more about paint than I wanted to know. But Pond Boss is going to help you not pay as much dumb tax with your pond and lake, 35 bucks a year. And we also have a, a number of resources that don't cost, although they cost us, they don't cost you. Resource Guide, which has got a lot of good vendors um, in here. And, you know, we vet, we vet our advertisers and our vendors. So that's a good resource guide. I also want to say thank you to Purina Mills for sponsoring this show. I just got a load of Purina fish food, some Aquamax. Picked it up last Friday. Filled the feeders up. Bluegill are already tearing it up. <clears throat> I'm a little bit behind. I should have got on it earlier, but hey, I just, I just did. Also appreciate Texas Hunter. They're a sponsor as well. Great feeders. That's the only feeder I use anymore is Texas Hunter because they're excellent products and their customer service cannot be matched. They're great. You know, in Easy Docs of Texas, David Schneiderman, he's been a sponsor for a long, long time, and I appreciate him. All right, so Howard Dittrick. I don't have milky water. Found one-third of smaller lake has a brown-green bloom with 22-inch visibility, but two-thirds of the lake is still quite clear. Can it be unequal? Yes, it can. It can be unequal and brownish. So what that means to me, here's what that means to me, is that part of the lake is able to take a bloom better than the rest of the lake, which also suggests that the lake isn't mixing as well. So I would focus in on getting some more fertilizer in that brownish part of the lake to, to stimulate that bloom and, and, and fertilize the, for the volume of that piece of the lake. And what I think will happen is that bloom will kick in and with a little bit of wind and wave action, it'll migrate farther out in the lake and initiate and, um, that bloom. It's kind of like, kind of like the old concept way back in the seventies when they thought they could seed the clouds or seed the sky and cause rain. You know, if you can get if you can get enough fertilizer mixed into the water column and overcome the high alkalinity, if that's what it is, which I think it probably is, 
then when that bloom kicks in, it's going to spread out through the rest of the lake and you're going to be in good shape. But yes, it can be unequal and brownish. It absolutely can. Okay, let me see here. Colin Owens, Bob, what I'm late to the game, is this fertilizing and bloom visibility primarily for southern ponds? Yes, it is. It's primarily for southern ponds. Now, uh, earlier in the broadcast, I explained it a little bit. I'm going to hit it again because it's really important. In Midwestern ponds, it's, it's a little tougher to try to get a plankton bloom and then manage it because your growing season is a little bit shorter than it is in the south. And in northern ponds, it's even a shorter growing season. So your window is very, very narrow. But one of the bigger issues is the amount of fertility that flows in through the watersheds. So if you're in one of the flyover farming states, I would expect a higher level of nitrogen, a higher level of phosphorus, and phosphorus is not going to be your limiting factor. Where in the south, phosphorus is the limiting factor. Now, I've had many, many talks with biologists, and Bruce Kanye, for example, in Montana. He does everything he can to extract phosphorus from his water because he's got too much. But he's also surrounded by thousands of acres of cornfields that are irrigated from water coming out of the Yellowstone River that percolates through gravelly soils and ends up coming down his watershed. So he's got a whole lot of, of high phosphorus fertilizers. And, the, and a big part of the Midwest is, is cursed and blessed with that issue. So biologists in the Midwest are a little more concerned with trying to diminish the volume of, of phosphorus than add to it. And in the South, it's totally different. Michelle, I did a little shout out to Michael a while ago. If he just tuned in, I'll do it again. Michael Reese, glad you're watching this show. I appreciate it, man. It's uh, it's pretty fun to to see who watches and, and you know who kind of gets something out of this. And and I'm so glad that you got a pond in Kentucky and that you're able to hang out with us. Ian Swinger, what's the best thing to plant on the back side of a dam for erosion? Whatever is the best turf grass in your part of the country, like here. It's Bermuda grass. Common Bermuda grass is the very best. Now, it also depends on the time. You know, you want to get something that can get its roots in, uh, like in the fall. In Texas, wheat. Even in Iowa, wheat would be a good one. Or of some wildlife mix. Uh, fescue in, in, in um, uh, Missouri, for example, is a good one. Although fescue has absolutely no socially redeeming value other than it can hold soil in place. So... Visit with your, here's what I'm going to tell everybody. If you just built a dam and you don't know what to plant on it to, to hold the soil in place, get with your county agent or local seed companies and find out the mixes that work best for that. Because there are seed mixes that are, that are designed to do that job. Harrison Davis. Better late than never. <laughs> Ron Ardwan, Boudin, Ardwan. Stop watching The Bachelor and get to painting. Cheers, Ron. This is not wine tonight. And it's not Boudin. Oh, 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 hey, Ron, tell your dad, tell your dad that his crawfish cornbread recipe, not cornbread, cor crawfish bread recipe is going to be in the May-June issue of Pond Boss with his picture, his picture of stirring his etouffee <coughs> and uh, the crawfish bread. It's, what, it's a great recipe. And to kind of give you guys a little tease, um, I got to hang out with Ron a few weeks ago and his dad cooked for us and, and, and uh, Christopher Aguilar showed up and we actually did the Facebook Live. That was a Wednesday. But uh, Ron's dad, Ron Sr., made crawfish cornbread. And what he did was he, he took the Holy Trinity and added the Pope, which for those of y'all that know anything about Creole cooking and uh, uh, Cajun Cuisine, the Holy Trinity is celery, bell pepper, and onion sautéed with a little vegetable oil and butter. And then the Pope is adding garlic to it. And so he made that little concoction and then added crawfish tails to it. Then he adds a can of uh, celery soup and mixes it up and lets it simmer and sauté. Then he adds a couple of pounds of crawfish tails and lets them cook. 
And when they're all done, he adds eight or nine or 10 ounces of, of uh, shredded cheddar cheese, puts it on sourdough bread, closes it up, sticks it in the oven to keep it hot, and then slices it, and oh my word, it's, it's really, really good. Stop watching The Bachelor. Uh-huh. Get the painting. Yep, you know what? The trim, all we got left in this dadgum house is, is cedar trim. Okay, um, let's see here. Colin Owens, Utah, dry, clean, clear spring water ponds. You know, I tell you something, Ashton Chandler is on vacation in Mexico. She's got her phone right in front of her, and she's watching this show. The smartest, my golly, I love you, honey. Thank you very kindly. That's that's pretty dyed gum nice. Um, the dry, clean, clear spring water ponds. You know what, Colin? I'd be tempted to tell you, rather than fertilize those ponds, feed a high-quality fish food, but be picky how much you feed. Only feed what your fish will consume in a short period of time. And that way you're going to minimize any risk of having excess nutrients. You know, now now I know in Utah, there's some areas in Utah and then parts of Idaho and, and parts of western Montana where there's some warm water springs. But if you have normal cool water springs, then I would be tempted to not fertilize those ponds. There's Elena Brinkman. I was wondering, do grass carp eat cattails? They do not. And Elena, the reason they can't is when you look at a grass carp, its its lips are right at the end of its face and they're real fleshy. Just, you know, kind of like that right there. There's a grass carp mouth right there, a real one. See that? That's what grass carp do. So they can't... <laughs> I know y'all are about to fall over laughing. So am I. But grass carp don't have any teeth. Now they've got these... Hey, Elena, you're going to love this. They've got these little pharyngeal or pharyngeal pads in the very back of their throat. So if they can bite something off and stick it down their throat, they have these little pads that can kind of grind it up and send it on down their digestive tract. Well, they don't have any way to bite those cattails, so they can't do it. They can they can grab bushy pond weed, American pond weed, coon tail. They can eat um, milfoil. You know, any kind of those plants that they can just grab it and then force it down their throats, grind it up a little bit, and then it goes through their digestive tract, then they can eat that. But the cattails are too tough. They can't do it. They can't eat uh, duckweed. <laughs> they can't eat duckweed because they can't stand on their tails to pull it off the surface. So that's a great question, but no, they can't eat. They cannot eat it. If you're near Texas... Uh, I love me some Ashton Chandler. Her husband is Debbie's son, Taylor, and I consider Taylor my son as well. If you're near Texas, check out Turner Seed Company. Yeah, I was going to say something about Turner Seed, but Turner Seed's great in Texas. They've been around a long, long time. So let's see, Ian's in, in Indiana, and Ian emailed me. Ian, I don't remember if I answered it or not. I've gotten a lot of emails in the last week, but if I haven't, I'll get to it. Danny Mac spent a lot of money on wild prairie grass and flower seed from a place in Junction. It's evolving yearly, but it's starting to slow. Yep. There's a number of seed companies out there, but that's, that's why I made the recommendation to get in touch with your county agent, your county extension agent, because they're going to know what grows best. And they're going to know where to acquire that seed as well. So let's see here. Um... Colin wants to, uh, oh yeah, okay, uh, you know what, thanks for that, I've reached out to you. Did you send me an email? If you did, I haven't gotten to it yet. I've been on a hard deadline with a number of projects, plus I got my day interfered with with a dentist appointment. I've got some teeth that need a little love. So uh, if you've emailed me, I will find it, and then I'll help you get a Texas Hunter feeder, because I can, I, can, I can do that. I know how to do that. Uh, Drew Bachman, how different are the steps? Oops. Something happened here. My thing just jumped. Let me find it. How different are the steps to a healthy spring-fed pond compared to a non-spring-fed pond? Well, now, when, when we hear about a spring-fed pond, our assumption is automatically going to go to this. It's going to go to its spring-fed, so water comes in, moves through, and then leaves in a constant flow. 
Now that's a true spring-fed pond. So that means that the water is going to be autonomous from the time it comes in to the time it leaves. The flow rate dictates what we do with the water in the pond. If the flow rate's five gallons a minute in a five acre lake, we're going to treat it differently than if it's 85 gallons a minute in a half acre pond. You know, so the flow rate dictates what we're going to do with that water and how we manage it, whether we try to amend it or fertilize it or whatever. But I think in that part of Texas, I mean, that part of the planet up uh, in Utah, it's a, it's a wiser move to bypass the fertility level of the food chain by using a good high quality fish food. So if you use a good high quality fish food, you're not worrying about water quality nearly as much because that fish food is going to get consumed. There's going to be a little bit of fish waste that insects and smaller fish are going to eat. And then they're going to convert that and it's going to be much, much more efficient conversion than, you know, trying to deal with spring water in a, in a Utah pond. Now, I'm not telling you you can't fertilize a Utah pond. I need to know more about it. But this is a one-hour show on Wednesdays. <laughs> so I'm real comfortable telling you what I just said. Okay, let's see here. Harrison Davis, you got a question. Let me see what that is. Can you touch up again on hybrid sunfish reproduction in ponds? Sure. <clears throat> you know, in, in nature, hybridization is pretty rare. And it's because, let, let's just take sunfish for example. There are lots of species of sunfish. I could, I could probably sit here and name 20 of them right off the top of my head. But they all have something just a little bit different. You know, they, they breed a little differently. They reproduce, like red breast sunfish live, they'll, they'll reproduce in a nest that's 40 inches in diameter. Bluegirl are going to spawn in colonies in beds that are about twice the size of a cattle hoof print, you know. <clears throat> and then they all spawn at different times between phases of the moon with different temperatures. But hybrid sunfish reproduction in ponds, there's two, there's two answers to that. You can go buy hybrid sunfish, put them in your pond, and 95% of those, if you buy them from a fish farm, 95% of those are males. And they're not going to reproduce with the 5% that are females. But those females and those males can reproduce with other species. So you get a back cross. You know, but uh, hybrid sunfish reproduction could also mean that you've got bluegills and green sunfish in a pond. And if circumstances are perfect, there'll be an occasional little cuck hole that'll come in. A little green sunfish boy that'll come and reproduce and squirt some of his stuff on some eggs where a bluegill's sitting on some eggs and fertilize a few of them and you get a handful of hybrids. So there's a little bit of that natural hybridization going on, but I think Harrison's question is, do hybrid sunfish reproduce? Uh, yes, they do, but it's a small, small, small amount and they typically don't reproduce with each other. Dwight Lee says, I missed the first part of the discussion. My one acre pond is fed only by runoff with spreading granular fertilizer like 13, 13, 13 on the hills providing the runoff be beneficial in adding nutrients to the water? No, it will not. If you fertilize your lawn according to the label, you're fertilizing your lawn. If that fertilizer makes it to the pond, then you don't know how much it's going in there. You've over-fertilized the lawn. You've not helped the pond. Now, I don't, I don't quite know where you are, Dwight, but if you want to fertilize the pond, fertilize it on its own merit. Based on the size of the pond and the average depth, <clears throat> the temperature and what your goals are and use the kind of fertilizer that's conducive to a bloom in a pond where you are. You know, so the thing about it, like in the South, what I said earlier is uh, phosphorus is the limiting factor in Southern ponds, but it's not a limiting factor in ponds in some of the Midwest, upper Midwest and Northern ponds. Most of those ponds have too much phosphorus. So, Biologists up there are trying to get rid of phosphorus, where down here, our phosphorus is actually being used in the food chain and converting to flesh with insects that feed the fish, that feed bigger fish, etc. So, Billy Granholm from McLeod Aquatics up in, outside of Chicago, Illinois. Ron said, 
I saw a solid black brim in my pond today, the second one I've ever seen. It proved to be blind. I was going to say that before I read that. All the other brim were responding to fish food we threw in certain areas. The black fish did not, but it seemed to be healthy, five, six inches, so it must be doing well on its own, eating insects, fish fry, eggs, etc. Please give us your knowledge, sir. Okay, let's see. Dwight Lee's in southern Mississippi. So I would be looking at, a, at like a, a 10340 or 11370, something like that, for your pond. Fertilize your lawn based on label directions. Fertilize your pond differently. Um, so Ron, let me tell you this. When I come across any fish that's black, first thing I know is it's blind because... Their eyes have these color receptors that send an impulse to the brain to tell the fish what color it needs to be. So when the water's clear, the fish is dark. When the water's murky, the fish is a lighter color. When it can't see, all it can see is black. That sends an impulse to the brain that makes the fish turn dark. So something has happened to cause that fish to be dark like that. Now, because it's in good condition, that suggests to me that hasn't been blind very long. Uh, typically, a fish that's blind ends up getting eaten or something happens to it and it disappears. And it's a five to six inch fish that makes me wonder if it doesn't have something that's caused it to go blind. Uh, if you can catch it, which I don't know how you tease a blind fish to eat your bait, but if you can catch it and look at it, give me a call because I'll tell you what I would do. I would, look, I would give a close look to its eyes because uh, in areas where there's a lot of bird migration, and this holds true for Drew Bachman, the whole Atlantic seaboard. I, I see this up and down the Atlantic seaboard when I travel over there. Even in the healthiest ponds, on occasion, there'll be a bluegill that gets these eye parasites. And it's a roundworm that enters the fish through its digestive system, migrates up into its head, and gets in behind its eye. And then it, then it begins to grow and expand inside the eye. You can actually look at the eye of that fish, and in the pupil, you can see these round, it's a round circle like a spiral where that parasite has coiled up inside that fish's eye and made it go blind. And it's feeding, it's feeding on whatever's in the eye, that jello that's in the eye of the fish. And if you've never cut open a fish, you need to dig into its eye, look at it, it's pretty cool. Okay, um, and I, you know I, I can't offer a whole lot more about the fish being black. It's it's not unusual. Uh, I, I will say it's rare, but it's not unusual to see a blind fish from time to time. All right, I never cease to amaze you. I amaze myself sometimes because I actually believe some of this stuff I'm telling you. <laughs> yes, I did call Doctor Koo. I had a long talk with him actually. Another article coming up in the May-June issue is called Fish Afflictions. I called Dr. Koo and I called, uh, I called a, a fish pathologist at Auburn. And the guy at Auburn is going to actually start writing articles for Palm Boss Magazine about fish diseases. And actually, Ron, I'm going to use some of your pictures you sent me. So, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty jacked up about that. Yes, I did. Had a great conversation with him. Uh, Colin Owens, when picking a feeding location on the pond, should I feed in the deepest part of the pond to avoid cranes eating the fish in shallower areas? Essentially training the fish to stay away from the shallow areas. Well, <clears throat> there's some ups and downs about that. Oh, and by the way, Ron, he did he did ask me, he did he did make reference that you had called him, but he hadn't heard from you since then, so I didn't say anything to him about that. I'll leave that to you. So Colin, um, you know what? Uh, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to tell you all a funny story, and it's going to answer that question. This was probably 2005. We lived at LL, two for about a year and a half before our house burned down there. And I'd set a feeder up on the swimming pond. Octo built a pond in 2003. And we had some really good bluegills by then. We had some bluegills that were five or six or seven inches long, and I was in upstate New York working on a project up there that consumed two to three weeks every month, and I loved it. It was fun. And Debbie called me one day when she was having coffee, and she said, Lusk, where's your shotgun? Well, I got a 410 shotgun that my daddy gave me when I was 13 years old, 
and she wanted it. So I said, what are you going to do? Why do you want my shotgun? She said, well, there's this big, tall, gray bird out there, and he just caught one of our bluegill off the feeder, and I'm going to shoot it. Look, first of all, it's illegal. But I didn't tell her that. I said, well, honey, why would you want to shoot that bird? Well, I don't want it eating your bluegills. I said, well, honey, that bird's just trying to make a living just like we are. And then we talked about other things. And I got home three or four days later. And we were sitting outside. She was drinking coffee. And uh, the feeder went off. And here comes that bird. And he snags about a five or six inch bluegill. And I got up. And she says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go get my shotgun. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to shoot that bird. She said, you can't shoot lurch. Well, she named the damn bird. So I thought about it a little bit, and I thought, no, I can't shoot Lurch. <laughs> He's just trying to make a living. So I went over to the feeder, and I changed the timer to go off at 10 o'clock at night because I knew he'd be roosting at 10 o'clock at night. So here's the answer. Here's the answer, Colin, to your question. If you feed the fish in shallow areas, then if you're feeding by hand, that bird's probably not going to show up. And the fish are only going to be there until the feed's gone. Then they're going to go home. Now, if you feed the fish over deeper areas, like off the dock in water that's 12 feet deep, it won't be long till you see some of your big predator fish coming up and eating your bluegills. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've stood on the dock and thrown some feet out and watched these bluegill in a frenzy. And all of a sudden, here comes a six-pound bass blasting through the school of those fish. And he inhales two or three bluegill in one swipe. So, uh... There's what you can do. So, um, Ron's got some brim to send him. Danny Mac, a video of you dissecting. What's that? You know what, dude? Somebody videoed me dissecting the fish at the Institute of Hyropondology, which, by the way, <coughs> we're going to book the next Institute of Hyropondology. It'll be in the May-June issue of Pond Boss as to when and where. I'm still negotiating on where we're going to do that, but I'm working on that. Uh, that's where we have room for like 15 to 18 people, and we do some hands-on, some time in class. Speaking of that, before I end the show, you can go to pondboss.teachable.com, and you can see the Institute of Higher Pondology videos. And we've got 22 videos. We just finished one on fish habitat. That's probably the best one we've ever done. I don't have it uploaded there yet because I got to get Chico to do a couple more edits. Uh but if you if you want a piece of property and you've got water on it and you're getting ready to spend any any substantial chunk of money, you need to enroll in that and watch some of those videos because I promise you it's going to save some dollars. Ron says the fish somehow quickly heal during winter, but warmer temperatures and spawning are kicking the infection. Yeah, uh, he I think he's willing to help you. And there's also another guy um, that is willing to help as well. Jay Hafner, do you routinely stock golden shiners in a new bass brim pond? If so, how many? I don't routinely do that. I do that based on the needs of that pond. If I see the bluegill can't keep up, then I'll add some golden shiners. If I, if I see that, uh, that the other forage fish can't keep up, I'll add some golden shiners. If I see a niche where golden shiners fit, then I'll add golden shiners. If I see the bass are losing weight, and the brim aren't doing their job enough, I'll add golden shiners. But I don't do it routinely. Benefits to young of their largemouth bass outweigh the fact that shiners eat eggs? Yes, that's an absolute truth. Uh, young of the year largemouth bass, if I had my way, it would be just fine with me if a largemouth bass never reproduced in one of my managed ponds again. Now, I'm saying that a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but a whole lot not tongue-in-cheek because... What happens with almost every pond, they get to be bass crowded because people are not willing to harvest enough young of the year bass to get them out of there. And then they get up to a certain size and they stop growing. Whereas in theory, if we had a pond where the bass could not reproduce, then we could come in there and stock 15 or 20 per acre every year, get the growth rates we wanted, have the numbers we wanted and keep it closer to being balanced. But it's... I don't think golden shiners are ever going to disrupt a lake's ability to produce largemouth bass. If they do something seriously out of whack, there's not enough big bass to eat those shiners. So that's about all I got to say about that. And uh, it's about that time. This hour always seems to fly by. And I love you guys hanging out with me. It helps keep my brain rolling. And I love the questions. I really do. 
Palm Boss Magazine, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date, and it lasts a year. Go online to palmboss.com. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do, because this is the economy that fuels this kind of stuff that I get to do for you guys. So, uh, also, Beyond the Basics is out. Here's the book. Been talking about it for six or eight months. It is there, $29.95, which includes shipping. You can order that on the Palm Boss online store as well as a subscription to the magazine. So, um, you know, going back to Jay's question real quick, I don't routinely stock gold and shiners, but I do see where they they can play a good role. So there's times I will use them. Like Howard Dittrick, he needs them over there in Florida. You know, there's people that absolutely need those fish, and I'm all for that. But I, to answer your question, I don't routinely do it. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to wrap it up and uh, just tell you guys again, thanks for watching the show. And, and Michael Reese, I'm glad you're a big fan, dude. So I appreciate you guys watching. And so until next Wednesday, not sure where I'll be, probably here, I hope, then uh, adios for now.